Good morning. I'm Brad Knox, Senior Vice President and Counsel for Federal Relations with AFLAC. I'm also a member of Meridian's Board of Trustees. As a Meridian trustee, it's been rewarding to see this year's summit have a truly global audience, a faithful reflection of Meridian's work and mission, which I believe is particularly necessary for a dialogue around the summit's global health diplomacy theme. This is the solution session on advancing equitable access to healthcare worldwide, where we will reflect on the pervasive inequities of access to affordable and quality health treatment, prevention, and care, exposed even more so across all nations and socioeconomic levels due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Key points for discussion today will be access to insurance, medical coverage and medicine, as well as internet connectivity, the size of healthcare workforces, healthcare infrastructure, and racial and ethnic disparities. This morning, we'll hear from the European perspective from His Excellency Stavros Labrinidis, the ambassador of the European Union delegation to the United States. This will be followed by a fireside chat between journalist Ms. Tara Kangaloo and Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions toward the latter half of the program. At no time has it been more important for the world's public and private sector leaders to renew our collective focus on global health as this pandemic has presented daunting challenges to health systems worldwide. Whether our health system is public, private, or a combination of the two, no system has had a flawless response to the pandemic because no system is perfect and no one can resolve this crisis alone. Public and private sectors must work together to meet the demands on our healthcare systems and ensure critical care uh, for those who need it, regardless of race, income, geography, or type of insurance. Recent studies show this is the most unequal recession in modern US history, hitting black and Hispanic communities especially hard. Analysts estimate that at least 1 million Asian, 2 million black, and 3 million Hispanic people are likely to lose their employer-sponsored health coverage in the United States this year. Clearly, this, there's a need and opportunity to focus on reducing health disparities in the United States, and I hope that time is now. I have a unique view on the subject because of my work at AFLAC, a leading provider of supplemental health insurance in both the United States and Japan, two very distinct health systems. In Japan, AFLAC is the leading provider of medical and cancer insurance, insuring one out of every four households. But my comments today will focus on our work in the US where we pay cash to policyholders to help them cover expenses not covered by their major medical insurance, providing a level of financial security. We recently published our 2020 annual AFLAC Workforces Report, which analyzes the impact of healthcare costs and COVID-19 on employees' financial security. Our research confirmed that financial insecurity is a major issue for American workers and that healthcare costs are a strong contributing factor. While nearly half of employees report, <clears throat> excuse me, they can't afford $1,000 for out-of-pocket medical expenses without relying on debt or credit, the numbers are worse for black and Hispanic workers. The average out-of-pocket expense people can afford drops by $400 for Hispanic individuals and $800 for black individuals. The research also affirms why financial insecurity has become more widespread during the pandemic. 36% of employees report losing a job or income and 13% report losing their health benefits. The decisions employees make in response to these adverse events will have far reaching implications on their well being today and in the future. Consider that to pay for medical expenses, many employees reported delaying buying a home or a car, putting off higher education, marriage, or even starting a family. And to pay for health emergencies, more than half of employees reported filing for bankruptcy, missing a mortgage or car payment, and saving less for retirement. The impact of COVID-19 on employees across the U.S. is significant, and those who rely on employer-sponsored health coverage may experience greater levels of financial insecurity as businesses continue to cut costs to survive the pandemic. Prominent research organizations predict massive losses of employer-sponsored health coverage in the U.S if businesses reduce expenses like health coverage. In May, the Kaiser Family Foundation estimated that 27 million people had lost coverage in the pandemic. Compare that to 1 million that lost coverage in 2019, the gravity of the difference is, is severe. 
The studies by the Urban Institute and Avalier Health highlight the disproportionate effect of the loss of health coverage on Black and Hispanic workers. It is my hope that we can reverse these trends. COVID-19 presents us with many challenges, but today we have an opportunity to focus on the positive, advancing equitable access to healthcare worldwide. I'm grateful for the opportunity to join this conversation and to work together to find solutions. Now, I am honored to introduce His Excellency Stavros Labranidis, Ambassador of the European Union Delegation to the United States. Ambassador Labranidis has served in this role since early 2019 with a distinguished career in foreign diplomacy long before, holding positions in the EU and European Parliament and as the Greek Foreign Minister. Ambassador Labranidis, we are delighted to have you join us today. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, and thank you to, uh, to Meridian for, uh, uh, for this uh, very timely and excellent uh, gathering. Uh, now, dear friends, uh, COVID has um, um, highlighted what we knew all along, which is that you cannot understand health unless you understand the economy, unless you understand the society, uh, unless you understand governance, unless you understand the environment, and unless you understand the global picture and uh, this is what uh, these five elements are what I, I, I would like to focus on uh, with these brief remarks uh, this morning. Uh, it is very clear, we know this now, that a pandemic like COVID can have catastrophic consequences on the economy and Brad mentioned um, a number of those. Uh, but it's also clear that how the economy is structured uh, around healthcare systems, for example, or even around uh, employment uh, systems, uh, does make a huge difference when a pandemic hits. Uh, in the case of uh, Europe, uh, we do in fact provide uh, universal health coverage. Every EU member state does it in a different way. But fundamentally, um, when you look at the um, adverse effects that COVID had in the United States, as Brad described them, uh, this is something that you did not see in Europe. We most certainly were hit. Our health uh, uh, systems, um, as advanced as they are, uh, also were stretched to the limit at the beginning. Uh, but it was entirely clear that you would not be prevented from being treated from COVID uh, because of your race or your economic status uh, or your educational status or the job that you may or may not have uh, held. Um, inequalities in Europe in the way that people can access health uh, most certainly still exist. Our systems provide universal health coverage. Everyone is covered irrespective of whether or not they have a job that they don't or who they are. Uh, but certainly there's also private health coverage uh, in many of our member states. Um, it uh, does tend to be in some instances uh, more advanced uh, than the public one and uh, how much money you make uh, and how easy your ability to access those different services is, um, can and does uh, determine sometimes your treatment. But you will not be left on the side of the road um, because of um, either losing your job or being whoever you are in Europe. That is important. That is an emphasis that we have placed. So it also ties in with what I would call the second element of understanding health, which is society more broadly. So for Europeans, uh, health is uh, both a human right, uh, but also an economic right. Uh, and this is why we have focused so much on ensuring that we can decouple uh, one's status as a citizen in any particular country from their ability to access health. Uh, everyone deserves and needs to be able to be treated uh, when they get sick. This cannot be negotiated away uh, or allowed to, uh, to so-called free market forces to determine in every particular instance. At the same time, it is absolutely clear that um, in Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, if you do not receive adequate health because of your sex, for example, um, and in many parts of the world, uh, women, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, health coverage, including um, coverage uh, that uh, relates to uh, reproductive health, uh, you have situations where big chunks of the population are excluded from the economy. The economy itself suffers dramatically by those inequalities. And in the case of COVID, we have seen a different kind of inequality develop uh, when it came to, uh, let's say, blue collar workers. What many of us could do by simply switching to Zoom or to WebEx or what have you, because our jobs allowed that, usually 
white collar jobs is not something that you could have in blue collar workers, which is why you saw the great hit in Europe, around the world, in the US uh, on those as well. Uh, a second element when it comes to society that I think was particularly distinct in the case of Europe is that we turn to science. So COVID in Europe didn't, at no point became polit a, a political issue. Uh, we trusted the fact that both science and real life experience gave us answers on how to address this. Uh, we trusted the fact that we had to immediately don masks, um, uh, try to uh, promote contact tracing apps, uh, privacy protective, but promote them as fast as possible and certainly get the capacity to test as many people as possible to ensure that then when there was a breakout, uh, you could actually address it fast. And this is perhaps why in Europe, our curve went up very high, very fast, and then it came down quite dramatically. Now we are in a stage where we have again an upsurge, the second wave as it is called, uh, but we are in a much better position today because of the way that we have approached science, because of the way that we fortified ourselves scientifically from the beginning of this crisis to address this very worrying and very concerning, if you like, um, upswing. Now, this dies in with a third uh, issue, which is governance. What many people don't know is that in Europe, uh, health is not a European Union competence. So much like the federal system in the US, the European system also works in a federal way. Uh, our 27 member states uh, decide to keep competences for themselves and decide to also share some competences with Europe. In the case of the US, that would be sharing competence with the, with the, with the federal government. Uh, health was not uh, an issue of uh, EU competence. And at the beginning of the crisis, people in Europe uh, and countries in Europe struggled to address it alone. And it became very clear very quickly that this wouldn't work. Uh, and so our member states turned directly to Brussels and said, we have to coordinate this. We have to coordinate how we procure PPE equipment. We have to coordinate how do we procure medicines. We have to coordinate how we open or close our borders. We have to coordinate on vaccines. And this is what has happened in Europe uh, in many ways in a very successful way. We didn't allow our member states to go out to the markets and duke it out with each other uh, on uh, procuring PPE equipment. We decided collectively to procure PPE equipment so that we as European Union would place a huge order, a very attractive order to those providing the PPE equipment at lower prices and then distribute that equipment back to our people. This is precisely what we're doing now with vaccines. So we have already, as European Union, uh, made contracts with three companies uh, that are in the process of developing vaccines uh, to buy vaccines uh, from them uh, to distribute around Europe. But we also have a vaccine strategy in place that um, encourages member states to coordinate on how to distribute those vaccines when they come out, because they will not come out massively immediately. It will be a process. And also those vaccines are not the same in each case. Some of them, I mean, this is like going down to the nitty gritties of things, but unless you do this, unless you trust science in this, you're gonna be in trouble. Some of them require particular uh, cooling temperatures to be preserved, others require other temperatures. Some require particular training of uh, medical staff to administer, others require other training. So from today, we are making sure that our member states who have the competence for health um, can prepare on this uh, collectively. And also, we have guidelines that uh, reflect the uh, World Health Organization guidelines on priority groups that should receive those vaccines. Because again, they will not be out there immediately, whether it is, um, you know, frontline workers, health workers, people at risk, etc. So um, this is the kind of thing that governance, if you like, does in this particular uh, case. Now, let me go to the fourth point, which is the environment. Um, the European Union feels that it's particularly well positioned to take leadership both in the health and the environmental aspects of this crisis. You know, I am a Greek, so <laughs> you will allow me to, uh, to, uh, to quote um, uh, Hippocrates. And he said back then in ancient times, he told doctors, study meteorology before you study medicine. Isn't that interesting? There's absolutely no question that what is happening in the environment affects today and will affect in the future even more a health situation. Rising temperatures and the way they affect biodiversity and the destruction that comes along. Uh, 
all these affect also infectious diseases. It is impossible to address this issue without addressing the environment. And we are determined to do this. We have committed ourselves as Europeans to uh, become carbon neutral by 2050. It's a huge investment, but we've always also made clear and sure that as we have this transition, we're not just doing it to save the planet, which frankly we have to. Climate change is an existential crisis, it's not a hoax. But at the same time, we ensure that we invest in millions of new jobs, which are going to be the jobs of the future, in new technologies, which are going to be the jobs of the future, and at the same time, that we make the transition just. In other words, we have already put together a huge fund called the Just Transition Fund to ensure that those areas in Europe, let's say coal mining areas, and there are many coal miners in Europe today, uh, and others that will have to transition away, will be able to feel the security uh, that they will be supported by the European Union in order to do so, in order to be able to transition to new jobs and new lives and not to be left in uh, the uh, presumed ability of the market to deal with that kind of disruption. That would be a mistake. And finally, dear friends, let me talk about uh, the world. Um, there is no question that international leadership and cooperation here is needed more than ever. COVID, as any pandemic, is a global crisis. And in that sense, it requires global solutions. It cannot be done by everyone hunkering down in their own bunker. It's not gonna work. So it's also very important at the time that we take care of people in Europe or people in the United States, that we're able to send a very strong message to the world that we are not being selfish, advanced economies, but that we are standing by and next to billions of people who live in countries that are not as rich, who live in countries whose healthcare systems are not as strong, and this is precisely what the EU has done as we have been battling COVID internally. One example, um, when it comes to vaccines, we led the effort with the G20 and others, the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, to have a conference to pledge money to develop these vaccines and also medicines to fight COVID. 16 billion euros were collected in that one effort and they went directly to all these organizations around the world who are at this stage developing these vaccines at the same time we have participated in the covax initiative around the world with 400 million euros that is an initiative that wants to ensure that these vaccines will be able to be provided to everyone who needs them around the world at a very low cost so that people can actually afford them and that is hugely important Another thing we've done is member states of the European Union, together with the European Commission, together with the uh, European Investment Bank, we have developed the Team Europe approach to COVID. 36 billion euros have already been dedicated to going directly to support those countries that are in most need to fortify the health systems because they're not strong enough, because they don't have enough uh, uh, health workers, because they don't have enough uh, medicine or equipment. Uh, and they've also gone to support their economies uh, to, uh, to survive uh, the crisis. And that as well is the kind of international leadership and solidarity that has to be shown and that is being shown today. So um, not to take more of your time, uh, but again, you cannot understand health unless you understand the economy and unless you ensure that no one is left behind. You cannot understand health unless you understand the society and unless you commit yourself to following science to ensure that the mistakes you made initially are not made again, you're better prepared. And to ensure that the crisis at hand can be addressed in a way that respects what those in the front lines tell us ought to be done, not us as we might desire life to be. You cannot understand health unless you understand society, unless you understand governance, 
unless you ensure that when, in fact, there are governance gaps, as in the case of the EU with health being an EU competence, at the, an EU member state competence, when the, uh, when the vaccine, when the, uh, uh, when the virus came out. Unless you understand those gaps, unless you're able in a very flexible and quick way to fill them in. You cannot understand health unless you understand the environment and how it affects it every day. And unless you take measures now to be able to ensure that as you're coming out of the COVID crisis, you don't go back to a 20th century carbon polluting economy, uh, biodiversity killing economy, but you go to an entirely different type of economy, which is going to be difficult, but perhaps the most promising thing that we can achieve. And you cannot understand health unless you understand the international global implications of it and the role that we have in it. In this international effort, in this international approach, the United States and Europe, if we work together, can make all the difference. And this is my work here as ambassador of the European in the Union in the United States. I work in Brussels. I hope we work in day and night to ensure that this is the reality, which is going to be good for us, certainly, but good for the world as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you so much for those very astute observations. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Tara Kangaroo, who will be hosting the fireside chat with Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Tara is an award-winning journalist, reporting, writing, and producing for domestic and global outlets like CNN, NBC, Huffington Post, Newsmax, and Al Jazeera. In, 19, in 2016, she founded The Art of Hope, a nonprofit that provides alternative educational and vocational training for Syrian refugees in an effort to address the massive mental health and psychological challenges among the refugee population. Tara, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, many thanks uh, to the ambassador and yourself for uh, this very important conversation uh, given the ongoing global uh, pandemic. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Dr. Monica Webb Cooper. Uh, she's a deputy director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health uh, disparities at the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C. She has worked closely with the director, Dr. Perez Stable, and the leadership to oversee all aspects of the Institute and support the implementation of the science visioning recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and of course, promote health equity the topic of our conversation. Now, with over 42 million coronavirus cases and a death toll that surpasses 1 million worldwide, including 8 million cases in the US and over 200,000 Americans who've lost their lives, the virus is ongoing and we're still grappling to address this pandemic. And of course, as we see in the United States and around the world, vulnerable communities are among the most affected which leads us to, again, this very important topic. Uh, Dr. Webb Hooper, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tara. Um, I'd like to just start before you ask questions uh, by thanking Meridian for hosting this important summit and specifically this, this conversation and this session. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you so much. Definitely, I, I I can't think of a better topic within you know uh, the discussion that's uh, that's going on uh, around the uh, coronavirus uh, than equitable healthcare for all. Uh, it's something that we're seeing around the world, but also in the U.S. I just came back from Lebanon, uh, a country uh, that was recently hit with with a huge explosion that is grappling. Uh, with uh, uh, a, a pretty much non-existent uh, economy as well as a massive influx of refugees on top of COVID. And while the explosion is very unique to Lebanon, I think uh, the, the challenges that a vulnerable country like Lebanon is handling in dealing with the pandemic is somewhat universal and uh, even though we're going to focus uh, on more domestic issues and the U.S., I think uh, the disparity in healthcare 
uh, is something that uh, many people around the world and in the U.S. can relate to. And with that, Monica, I want to just, you know, jump right into it. What do you think is the most significant barrier to equitable healthcare access in the United States today? And, and what, are, uh, what is your agency doing to address this challenge? Well, Tara, you bring up many important points and, um, you know, thinking about the United States, but recognizing that this is an issue globally, um, I'll focus on what the NIH perspective and the work that we are supporting in this regard consists of. We know that um, in the United States, disparities in health for many illnesses has existed. This is not a new problem. Um, but only for the past 35 years in the U.S. have we been tracking health disparities, um, and unfortunately, they do persist into 2020, despite many calls for change and lots of robust evidence of uh, disparities by race and ethnicity uh, and for income, for conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, and end-stage renal disease, and many others. And access to care is probably the most significant barrier to equitable health outcomes, and specifically access to high quality care. Having access to high quality health care that offers state of the science medicine um, and best uh, medical providers and specialists available, having uh, physical conditions within medical settings that are high quality, these are key social determinants of health. And when we think about the many factors that may limit or impede access to high, high quality health care. We talk about cost or affordability, adequate insurance coverage for most services and treatments, distance to healthcare facilities that offer the best care or even emergency services, um, access to parking or transportation to health facilities. And we must also consider diversity within the healthcare system. So the scientific investigation of health disparities, including the factors that impede equitable access to high quality care, is at the core of the mission of the National Institute on Minority Health or, and Health Disparities, or NIMHD. We are one of the 27 institutes at NIH, and we support cross-cutting research that advances the science in this area using multi-level approaches, such as ensuring that um, medical and technological advances reach populations and communities with high needs. Um, we focus on standardization of methods of assessment and measuring health care and health care outcomes um, and developing and implementing interventions to actually address health care disparities. And I think it's also important that we invest in training the next generation of scientists who are focused on these issues and who have the potential to turn the dial towards health equity. Excellent. I think uh, I want to follow up with, with what is it exactly that uh, NIH is focusing on when it comes to innovative high impact research addressing equitable healthcare. Uh, you know, our audience is both uh, domestic and also international. I think it would be quite interesting to, if you can tell us uh, some specifics uh, that you are doing right now as we speak. Sure, absolutely. Right now, uh, we are all dealing with the global COVID-19 pandemic, so I'll, I'll focus there. This is the crisis of the highest magnitude that any of us have witnessed um, in terms of health. And one great example of the sort of technology progress in healthcare inequities is COVID-19 testing. And NIH is working very hard to address the needs of underserved and vulnerable communities and to ensure their inclusion in the science. So I'll offer one example um, of an NIH significant initiative that does have potential for this. So the NIH Office of the Director received a congressional appropriation of $1 billion to study COVID-19 testing, specifically to develop, validate, improve, um, and implement testing and associated technologies. And this initiative is called RADx, or the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And it's one of the major scientific responses to the pandemic in the United States. And the Office of the Director at the NIH committed half of its $1 billion congressional appropriation for COVID-19 research, so $500 million to study COVID-19 testing 
specifically among underserved and vulnerable populations. And so this component of RADx is called RADxUP or Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Underserved Populations. And the goal of this initiative of RADx Up is to highlight the urgent need to understand and address COVID-19 morbidity and mortality disparities across the United States with a focus on COVID-19 testing. So we have a national consortium now of community engaged research projects focused on increasing access and uptake of COVID-19 tests. We realize that we have to ensure that we understand effective strategies to bring tests into communities with high needs, that we conduct repeat testing, contact tracing, that all of this reaches the groups that are hardest hit or the groups that face additional risks. And not only will we focus on testing with RADx up, the projects will also be focused on the social, ethical, and behavioral implications of testing under-resourced populations. So what happens when you test underserved groups? What are the next steps, You know, especially among individuals who may not have this privilege of being able to self-isolate? And how can we make sure that patients interpret their test results correctly? So RADx Up um, is a large scale initiative and we are prioritizing populations that are underserved and also who are vulnerable to COVID-19, particularly due to medical, geographic and social factors or people who are at high risk of exposure and potentially worse outcomes. Um, so these priority populations include patients across the lifespan and with medical comorbidities. And the work of Brad X will help advance the science of technology development with a focus on addressing health disparities. I see. Now, uh, with that said, you know, many see the pandemic's exposure of deep-rooted inequalities as one of the contributing factors to uh, what we've seen in the past couple of, couple of months uh, as far as uh, racial reckoning and, uh, you know, an, an uproar when it comes to social justice. And now, do you find that the pandemic and other social justice-related events can bring about sustainable change in the United States? Well, you know, um, it's another great question. Health disparities, as I mentioned, are longstanding in the United States and globally. And this year, driven largely by the collision of the COVID-19 pandemic and other disturbing social injustice events, have been described um, as one of sort of this year of racial reckoning in the United States, if you will. I think that COVID-19 is shining a very bright light on the existing disparities that have been known and studied for decades. And for COVID-19 and other health disparities, the factors that lead to them can be themed as related to health and health care, socioeconomics, um, and social determinants of health. But we cannot ignore the backdrop of systemic inequities, which directly affect health, irrespective of any of these factors. And it's also what we observe about the early data on COVID-19 transmission, infection, and death risk. So in my view, any explanations around COVID-19 health disparities must be considered in the full context of systemic factors, such as historical and ongoing discrimination um, and chronic stress and its effect on immunologic functioning and health. We do have strong evidence linking stress um, and it being related to, and, and other kinds of stress, such as racial discrimination, being related to increased risk of chronic diseases and negative health outcomes, and some that are also linked to COVID. I think it's critical that we really focus on a deeper level of analysis. And with that, we can utilize this critical window of opportunity that we have in front of us to understand and address the primary causes of health disparities. I think um, without that context, we risk um, a failure to realize the breadth of the factors that drive disparities and even preclude ourselves from learning from some past mistakes. Um, and this can lead to the introduction of ineffective or even harmful medical or policy solutions. So we have an imperative need here for implementing effective prevention and healthcare strategies that are aligned with the needs of communities to address the effects of the pandemic um, and as well focus on underlying inequities. Absolutely. Uh, and I also want to take a moment to invite our audience to submit their questions in the portal. Uh, we are here talking about uh, advancing equitable access to healthcare worldwide with, speci with a specific focus uh, on the United States right now with Dr. Monica Webb Hooper uh, from the National Institute of Minority Health. 
uh, disparities at the uh, NIH. Uh, Monica, I want to talk about um, mental health. Uh, you are a clinical psychologist, and I think I have to ask you this question, given my own work uh, on mental health among vulnerable communities, uh, specifically refugees and war-torn children. Uh, I think, you know, based on uh, my own work, uh, we are in ways facing a mental health crisis worldwide that is only amplified with uh, the the uh, ongoing pandemic. Now, as you know, when uh, there is a healthcare crisis, people are, are often focused on the emergency need and uh, the sort of short term support. Uh, and, and, it, and it's often that mental health is uh, forgotten in the midst. Now, do you, number one, agree that we are facing a, a, a global mental health crisis in light of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? And if so, what are some short-term and long-term policies that countries uh, should implement or the global community should implement collectively uh, to address this issue. And, and again, do feel free to speak to what's going on in the US given your own expertise. Sure, I think you're correct that given that SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, mostly what we have focused on are uh, health effects, medical complications, um, and the need for effective treatment to prevent further unnecessary mortality. And I think that's rightfully the first priority. Um, but within the conversations and the scientific efforts to understand the health effects of COVID-19, we must also include and increase attention to minority health, I'm sorry, to mental health, which we know is an important factor in overall health, and it has the potential to worsen physical health. I, I recall a study um, published by the Kaiser Foundation um, maybe a month or two ago, and it found it was it was limited to the United States, but it found that nearly half, uh, so about 45% of adults in the United States reported that their mental health has been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over this virus. And these are complex issues, um, and they become even more complicated when we think about um, moving beyond mental health, you know, impacts in general, but specifically on populations that we describe as vulnerable. Um, and I'd like to be clear that, you know, we're all we're all susceptible or vulnerable to this virus and subsequently COVID-19 because it's such a novel virus. But certainly since the, the global pandemic has really swept across the globe, it has led to the exacerbation of existing mental health problems and the onset of new symptoms. And I am concerned about, about, this, about this factor. At the NIH, we do have several funding opportunities to promote science to understand the behavioral, the psychosocial, and the economic impacts of COVID um, and how that's affecting mental health among many populations, but with that focus on the groups at, at greatest risk or are vulnerable to this um, to mental health concerns. So I think that we, we certainly are focused on it. Um, and more work needs to continue in this area. I think the study overall scientifically of the mental health effects of COVID-19 is nascent, but we do have early signals um, that we may continue to observe these upticks um, in various forms of um, difficulty coping. You know, this is something that we are, it looks like we're in this for the long haul. And so the ability to work with populations and deliver treatments in ways that can be accessible will be important. Absolutely. I think accessibility is, is quite important. We just passed the uh, World Mental Health Day uh, on October 10th, and, and the theme this year was accessibility. And in many parts of the world, um, mental health care is privatized and uh, not easily and readily available to the larger population. And as you mentioned, uh, it is the, the vulnerable communities, the marginalized societies are, the fr are on the front line uh, in not only dealing with uh, emergency medical need, but also mental health. So certainly it's something that uh, needs to be addressed uh, worldwide and implemented uh, on a, on a uh, policy front. Now, my last question to you, and then we're gonna go to the audience. So uh, I, I encourage everyone watching to submit your questions. Um, but, but Monica, if you were the uh, pandemic czar today, what uh, is the one action you would uh, want to implement in dealing with this crisis? You know, 
the pandemic czar, right? Wouldn't one of us want to be the pandemic czar to help to help us get through this 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 crisis? I mean, I think for me, what I would emphasize is that we are currently in a situation where our best opportunities for addressing the pandemic for us and our families and our communities staying well um, is to implement behavioral strategies. That's where we are right now. It's, that's the billion dollar question that you've asked. And as a clinical psychologist, I've helped countless numbers of people and had the honor to work with patients to help them change, for example, both their cognitions and their behavior to address a number of really um, recalcitrant psychiatric conditions. And currently our best intervention for gaining control of this, as I mentioned, is a behavioral one. So if I was the um, pandemics are at this very moment in time, I think the one action I would take would be to implement, you know, a large scale behavioral intervention at the population level. And the intervention would include what we know to be evidence based strategies such as cognitive and behavioral techniques to help the overall population address um, the emotions, the thoughts, and then the resultant solution oriented behaviors, so that everybody would be committed to the implementation of public health guidance and mitigation strategies that we know work and that we all currently have, you know, to some degree, some ability to control. And recognizing, though, that we have to in, apply an equity lens to this work, recognizing that not all communities have the same opportunities to be able to practice behaviors such as physical distancing. Um, and so we'd have to think about how to ensure that this intervention, if we thought about some grand large scale behavioral intervention, would be able to apply the equity lens and provide appropriate supports that are proportional to the needs so that we can all feel safe and feel comfortable um, as we navigate this challenge. Absolutely. Uh, I think in, in as we go through this global pandemic, we, we have to be cognizant of, of others around us. And um, that's that's something that would certainly help us get through uh, this crisis. Now, uh, going to the audience questions, um, uh, we're going to touch on something very specific that we discussed on, on a broader scale. And that is, uh, Monica, can you speak more to how COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting the African American community? Yes, so I can speak to that. Um, we know and we've known early on as we were requesting data by race and ethnicity um, that COVID-19 uh, was having a disproportionate impact on communities that already experience health disparities. And African Americans are among them. African Americans represent about 13% of the United States population, but account for about 21 to 22% of COVID-19 mortality. This is a population also at greater risk of uh, hospitalization and, um, and more severe outcomes. And so it's a major focus of NIMHD to focus on addressing the needs of African-Americans. And I would say also that uh, Latino Hispanics are also um, a group that is facing an undue burden, a disproportionate burden of COVID-19. And there are, are fewer data on smaller populations such as Native Americans or American Indians. Um, and also Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who also are facing a disproportionate burden of infections and death from COVID-19. And I think that um, this is why, and one of the reasons why people discuss the sort of racial reckoning, because we're seeing, and I think it's opening the eyes of many for the first time who hadn't really thought about this issue or, or disparities wasn't at the forefront of their work or their minds. And it's really demonstrating to us that, that there are many um, cracks in the system that must be addressed to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again and that so that we can work to reduce and hopefully eliminate the disparities that we're seeing specifically by race and ethnicity um, in the United States. I see and, and, and unfortunately that is that is continuing uh, as as we see across the states and now uh, my next question is, is, is a great one that I think uh, many can learn from. Are there any cities or states that you can uh, pinpoint who have done a successful job in supporting uh, the African-American communities or you know, the minorities in handling uh, the pandemic? So this question, um, <clears throat> I've been asked this question before, um, and based on the data that are available I wish I could be more positive and say yes, that there are great exemplars that we could use as a model to follow their example. 
Um, and even in, in, in cities, in large U.S. cities like New York City, for instance, which was at first the United States epicenter and one of the most successful states with a large population, able to bring their curve down significantly. And now in New York City, there are hot spots of outbreaks. But when you look at and you look closely at where those outbreaks are happening, it's in communities that are largely racial ethnic minorities. So large populations of Latinos and large populations of African Americans. So on the, the basis of the data that I have access to, you know, the disparities are consistent and they're pervasive and they show a greater risk um, in terms of infection and mortality among African Americans and the other racial ethnic groups that I've mentioned. So it's something that you know we have to really focus on and, and stay focused on um, as we continue to go through this pandemic. But I don't have any great examples. I'm looking for one, and if someone has one, please send it to me. No, and and I think that itself uh, is an important point, which uh, really leads us to uh, how and why we need a greater effort in in addressing this issue. Uh, my next question is uh, from an audience who who thanks you. As, as we we have also, and she's glad to see uh, an African-American woman leading the response to COVID. Um, so this is a personal uh, message to you. Um, now, uh, this person wants to ask how uh, we can uh, destigmatize mental health in this context and combat the idea that those affected are weak. And this is an incredible question, uh, which I also appreciate from, from this member of the audience. What do you think, Monica? Well, I appreciate uh, the acknowledgement. So thank you for the question. Um, and I'm I'm honored to be in this position to have a voice. Um, and but many times I think it's not about being a voice at the table, but just passing the microphone to others so that they can speak themselves. Um, and mental health is something that we know in general has been highly stigmatized, particularly um, in our underserved communities and our racial ethnic minority communities. Um, and I think it's something that for many populations, such as African Americans in the United States, who have been resilient, I think that the pain that the community has experienced over time sometimes doesn't equate to a mental health problem. It's life, unfortunately. And um, there are there are people who are working on this effort. And I think that we've seen a positive change with regard to the uptake of evidence-based um, psychological and therapeutic interventions for mental health in our racial, ethnic minority and underserved communities. We still have a ways to go in this effort. And um, so some of the work that we are focused on at NIH right now is addressing mental health among underserved communities and racial, ethnic minorities to say, how do we create interventions that are culturally and community responsive, that perhaps the one size fits all approaches that we use that have been designed for the majority population may not be those that resonate with the current circumstances, the psychological, the physical, the economic, and health circumstances of the populations that we wish to that we wish to make sure also have benefit to these interventions. And in my own research, um, that's been an area of focus for me is developing and testing um, evidence-based approaches to incorporate ethnocultural factors into intervention approaches, which I think is essential. Yeah, actually, that's a great point. That leads to my next question, or you know, the audience's next question, which is a good follow-up. Do you think um, you know some of the behavioral, uh, psychological barriers to appropriately addressing COVID are also intertwined with uh, deep-rooted cultural considerations? Which I think you you spoke to to an extent, but let's talk about this because this is important, especially when talking about uh, ethnic minorities, uh, in, you know, around the world, quite frankly. You know, I think that. Um, there is a complex interchange of factors that are contributing to the current circumstances as relates to COVID and health disparities in general. So I think about it as a multi-level um, model, if you will, to think about that there are individual and cultural uh, factors that are at play with the way people live and practice and um, and behave, um, thoughts, emotions, the way that, you know, the way that lifestyles are. But then there are also upstream determinants of health and mental health that I think are often not brought into the picture. And those are, you know, thinking about the interpersonal level, the organizational level or the institutional level, healthcare systems level, 
policy levels, all of these upstream factors are having an impact on individuals and on individual cultures and on the way that uh, our lived experiences are brought forth. And so I think that in my work at the individual level, I have focused on addressing and attending to important cultural factors. If we don't focus on those, then I think we do risk um, that uh, there may be less interest or uptake or acceptance of various intervention approaches that we think are evidence-based, but we also have to really uh, work with the affected community specifically in the development of these approaches. It should not be, you know, researchers in isolation working on this, but certainly equitable partnerships with affected communities has been a cornerstone of my work and what we promote heavily at NIMHD. I see. Um, Monica, I want to uh, conclude our uh, very rich conversation and uh, your fantastic input uh, with one last question, and that is, you know, as a leader uh, in the U.S. within the uh, healthcare uh, space, uh, and also, uh, a, you know, an African American woman, uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, the society can learn and what can we take away as individuals really living together side by side in the U.S. who are in ways uh, disillusioned and, and sort of discouraged with how things have been handled. Uh, do you have any hopeful thoughts that you can leave uh, our audience with in, in dealing with a pandemic and how we as individuals can help one another, whether it be in uh, marginalized communities or or elsewhere? You know, I appreciate that question and the opportunity to leave a difficult conversation on a positive note. Um, I would I would offer that there is hope that we will get to the other side of the pandemic, um, that we'll look back at 2020 and into 2021 in the rearview mirror and hopefully have learned a lot about this experience and how we can prevent something like this from happening going forward. I also do see this as a window of opportunity to bring to the forefront many issues that people weren't discussing before. I can't think of a time where I've heard more conversation about topics that you typically don't address, such as systemic racism or discrimination, um, that this and other social justice events have really brought into the forefront of people's minds. And while we have captive audiences, I think we need to leverage that, that this time to make sure that we can improve health for all. That's the goal. The goal is to achieve health equity. I think we can get there, we recognize the same scenario with varying life experiences, but ultimately we want to make sure that we can help everyone have the best opportunities for optimal health. There are people who are working on this and who are in positions to help move some of this forward. I'd like to think of myself as one of them, um, but I think there's hope, but we all have to continue to have these conversations and actually convert conversation into Definitely. Uh, converting conversations into action is uh, certainly uh, important and one that I hope, you know, we can take away. Uh, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, uh, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institute of Health. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and I want to thank all of our audience and of course the Meridian Summit for this fantastic conversation. And also I want to thank uh, Mr. Brad Knox as well as uh, Ambassador uh, Lambrinidis for uh, their remarks earlier. Now for everyone watching, I ask that you click on the button below to uh, go to the uh, main uh, uh, conference space. And I would, uh, with that note, I would say goodbye to you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for having me. Thank you.